Imagine you. sit and watch games with him you know a lot of things I learned by being just being around the game mm -hmm. right so by the age of six I was already strategizing versus other six-year-olds you know the age of six I figured out six-year-olds couldn't dribble with their left hand so like yeah. when I was playing these six-year-old kids I would make them dribble with their left because I knew they couldn't <laughs> and so they dribble off their foot I'd pick it up lay it up do it again dribble off foot pick it up lay it up so at six years old I had 63 points I just constantly looked for things to learn from and uh, you know, very observant. The passion came from the love for the game. You know, I, I loved everything about it, like the smell of the ball, you know, the smell of like brand new sneakers and like the sound the ball makes when it hits the ground, the ball going through the net, like all those things I, I love. And so the passion comes from that because once you have that love, you just want to be a part of this thing all the time. I was born and I was born to play basketball, you know what I mean? And I played a lot of different sports, um, but nothing brought me the sense of, of, of peace and of uh, escape you know, that the game of basketball did. When I need that escape, it's there for me, right? When I need a friend, it's there for me. You know, when I need to vent and don't dunk and it's there, you know? So it's, the game is absolutely everything for me. I had goals, you know, I had expectations and things I wanted to accomplish, you know, and so like the outside world uh, could not meet that for sure. Like, mm -hmm. I, I knew I wanted to win like five, six, seven yeah. championships. You know what I mean? That was my goal. For me to come out and say that, people would think I was a lunatic, you know? So no matter what they said or what they threw at me, my expectations were certainly higher. But you know, you can't, you can't control that passion, man. You know, sometimes you just kind of have a fire and you need to need to keep those flames burning. yeah man nothing you can do about it like you, you you don't really have much of a choice like you wake up in the morning and you go even if you tried to dial it back it'll just build up and build up and then it'll just like come out 10 times worse than it was before can't really control it there's a quote from uh, one of my english teachers at Lord marion named uh, uh, mr fisk he had a great quote that said rest at the end not in the middle and that's something i always live by I'm not going to rest. I'm going to keep on pushing now. There are a lot of answers that I don't have, even questions that I don't have. But I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going, and I'll figure these things out as we go, right? And you just continue to build that way. So that, I try to live by that all the time. What was really your work ethic like, and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean, I mean, every day. I mean, since you know, for 20 years. I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Man, my vertical was a 40. It wasn't a 46 or a mm -hmm. 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive, 
right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them so your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast, right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it though. So like from the time I was, I can remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game mm. and it just never changed. What does losing feel like to you? Uh, it's exciting. Why is it exciting? Um, because it means you have different um, ways to get better. There's certain things that you can figure out that you can take advantage of, right? Certain weaknesses that were exposed mm. um, that you need to shore up. Right, so it was exciting. I mean, it, I mean, it sucks to lose, right. but the hardest thing is to face that stuff. Um, that's a really, really tough challenge. As athletes, the psychology is before you start a game, how can you lock in and get into that mental space where nothing else matters? You're completely locked in and focused on what you're trying to accomplish as an athlete out here. The noise of the crowd doesn't matter. Whether the cheering or booing doesn't matter. You're just completely locked in. How do you do that? And if we're talking about you know, a basketball decision where, you know, read a certain coverage or something like that. I mean, a lot of that comes from the, the pre-work, pre-work and understanding what their defensive package is and uh, how to put teammates in certain situations. For example, if you look at players nowadays that are charged with taking game-winning shots, or making game-winning decisions, mm -hmm. and you look at the play and then you look at it and say, okay, well, that shooter was there, the double team came and, you know, the player couldn't do anything but pass the ball, right? Well, that's because they didn't do the pre-work. So when you do the pre-work, you understand, okay, this team in this situation likes to run a double team from this particular angle. All right, so I'm gonna clear that side out, force the double team to come from a different angle, move myself to a space on the floor where it's gonna take a long time for the double team to come, and now I can circumvent the double team and get to a place on the floor where I can knock down a shot and get to the basket. So it's, it's all that pre-work. Well, I mean, here, here's why practice was important to me. It, not from the, just the standpoint that I enjoyed playing. Like, I enjoyed being there. Um, I enjoyed getting better. But as a leader of a team, it's also your responsibility to elevate the rest of the guys. And what people tend to get stuck on a lot is saying, okay, the way to make players better is to pass them the ball when they're open. That's a very trivial way to look at things you have to do is you have to get them emotionally to want to be better you want you have to get them to an emotional space where they wake up every morning driven to be the best version of themselves right how do you do that and in practice for me it was a chance to, to drive them to challenge them right if they're and this is where you have to know your teammates because if it's late we just had a back-to-back -back and we had practice the next day and you show up Guys don't feel like going through the motions, don't feel like practicing. It's important to know each and every one of them individually, personally, because then you know what nerve to touch. Some guys, it's like, okay, come on, let's, you know, we can do this. That'll get them going. Other guys, no. You got to figure out what button to push. You know, Powell was always Spain. If I tell them how they lost in a gold medal to us and how they're going to lose again, how I'm going to beat your ass practice just like I beat you in a gold medal game, oh, that, oh, he would hate that. <laughs> But that's what practice was. You have to drive them. You absolutely have to. And if practice is more intense and harder than a game seven will be, then a game seven will be easy. But if it's not, then that's when teams start folding and capitulating. I think the best way to prove your, your value is to work, is to learn, is to absorb, um, to be a sponge. But you always want to outwork your potential. You know, as hard as you believe you can work, you can work harder than that. And that's what I tried to do when I first came in the league. But, you know, basketball is such a direct competition sport. That competitive nature, the work ethic, and curiosity. Because I asked a lot of questions. You know, playing with Byron Scott, I asked him a lot of questions. Eddie Jones, who was great at chasing guards off the screens, and I didn't understand how to do that. I would sit with him before practice, after practice. Um, Magic, um, James Worthy, Kurt Rambis. Kareem Abdul, all the Laker greats, I would always sit down and just ask them questions about certain games that I studied growing up. What actually happened there? What did you feel there and why? You know, Bird tough to defend, why? Because you look slow to me. Like I'm missing something, so like tell me what I'm missing, you know what I mean? And so 
I would always ask questions and try to learn as much as I could. I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. At, at what age did that goal become crystal clear? That I, made, I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. At 13 years 13 old? 13 years old. That's you the deal I made. You were crystal clear about it. Crystal clear. And where did inspiration come from? Um, the love of the game. The love of the game. The challenge. Like, I, I would watch Magic play. I'd watch Michael play. And I would see them do these unbelievable things. And I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Let's find out. And so that curiosity to see where I could push this thing led me down that path, I think. Were you always competitive from the day you were born? You were super competitive? Uh, competitive with things that I, I participate in. So, I, like, I'll put it to you this way. So, like, you know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, Everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything. Everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. My competitive, competitiveness inside was like, I'm going to do something in the next 20 years that is better than these last 20. So at 13 years old, I had a, um, <laughs> I had a kill list. And so, you know, they used to do these rankings. It was Street and Smith basketball rankings. And I was nowhere to be found because I was like 6'4", scrawny, like 160 pounds soaking wet. So I was like 57 on the list. And so I would look at 56, 55, all the way up to number one, who these players are, what club teams they played for. So when we go on an AAU travel circuit, I, I got to hunt them down. Right? And so that became my mission in high school, is to check off every other person, all those 56 other names, hunt them down and knock them down. So when we played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it? Right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths, I played to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you gonna get better? I was working on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game, right? So I have a strategy. How did you get mentally and emotionally so strong where it doesn't bother you? Well. You know, it's, you got to look at the reality of the situation. You know, like for me, it's not, you know, you, you kind of got to get over yourself, right? And then after that, it's okay, well, why did those air balls happen? Got it. I didn't have the legs. So you look at the shot, every shot was online. Every shot was online, but every shot was short, right? I got to get stronger. Uh, I got to train differently. The weight training program that I'm doing, I got to tailor it for an 82 game season. Mm -hmm. So that when the playoffs come around, my legs are stronger and that ball gets there. So I look at it with rationale and say, okay, well, the reason why I shot air balls is because my legs aren't there. I go, well, next year they'll be there. You have to do the hard stuff and watch that game and study that game to not make those mistakes over and over again just because you weren't brave enough to face it. So you gotta deal with face it. Face it. Gotta deal with it. Face it, learn from it. You don't want to have that feeling again, do you, right? So you got to really study it, face it. And uh, not to say you'll win the next time you face it, but at least you'll, you'll give yourself a better, yeah. a better chance. Yeah. It's an obsessiveness that comes along with it. You want things to be as perfect as they can be. Understanding that nothing is ever perfect, but the challenge is try to get them as perfect as they can be. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? It's in your control. So control what you can. How did you develop that? And well, when did it start? Uh, it started in, in middle school and high school. Because a lot of the kids that I was playing against were inner city kids. Yeah. And so they're looking at me as if, okay, this kid's soft. They felt like they could try to be physical or try to intimidate me and do all this other stuff, which they couldn't, right? But now I'm saying, okay, well, you're trying to attack me. How am I going to attack you? How can I mentally figure out ways to break, break you down? How can I show you that, no, I have the edge, right? And so. That's when it first started for me, is figuring out how to get the upper hand on an opponent that way. 
And what would you do to mm -hmm. mentally break people down then? One of the things I would do is while everybody would be at the cafeteria work, you know, eating and doing all sort of stuff, I'd just go back to the gym. And so that was my way of, sh of showing them, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I may be from the suburbs, but you're not going to outwork me. I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends. And they'll just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out. Like, I, I, I'm not, I never did that. But why, it was a why, not, why, why, why didn't you do that? What, well, because when I retire, I didn't want to have to say, I wish I would have done more. I don't want that. I play games with the flu. I play games with 102 degree fever, man. We had a game against Toronto in 2000. Um, and Vince was tearing the league up. Um, my back was jacked, jacked. So I would be in the layup line like, okay, there's a lot of days where you know you can rest and recover. Today ain't one of them. Your back can bother you any other day. That ain't bothering me today. Wow. We going he gonna have to see oh, me man. today. I had a summer where I played basketball when I was like 10 or 11 years old, and here I come playing, and I don't score one point the entire summer. Not a free throw, not a nothing, not a lucky shot, not a breakaway layup, zero points. And I remember crying about it, being upset about it. And my father just gave me a hug and said, "Listen." Whether you score zero or score 60, I'm gonna love you no matter what. Wow. Now that is the most important thing that you can say to a child. Because from wow. there, I was like, okay, that gives me all the confidence in the world to fail. I have the security there. But to hell with that, I'm scoring 60. And from there, I just went to work. And I just wow. I stayed with it. And I kept practicing, kept practicing, kept practicing. I think that's when the idea of understanding a long-term view became important because I wasn't going to catch these kids in a week. I wasn't going to catch them in a year, right? So that's when I sat down and said, okay, this is going to take some thought, all right? Mm -hmm. What do I want to work on first? All right, shooting, all right, let's knock this out. Let's focus on this half a year, six months, do nothing but shoot, all right? After that, all right, creating your own shot. And you focus, so you start, I started creating a menu of things. Mm. When I came back the next summer, I was a little bit better. I scored, yeah, you know, it wasn't much, right. but I scored. And this know? is 12, 13. 12, 13, and then 14 came around back half of 13, 14 uh, years old, and then I was just killing everyone. And it happened in two years, and I wasn't expecting it to happen in two years, but it did, because what I had to do was work on the basics and the fundamentals, while well, they relied on their athleticism mm. and their natural ability. And because I stick to the fundamentals, it just caught up to them. And then my body, you know, my knees stopped hurting, I grew into my frame, then it was game over. I always dreamed as a kid that you know, it was possible to score 80 or 90 or 100. I always just like, you know, had a dream. You know, like sometimes you lay down in bed and you visualize things. And you just kind of, you know, just, you know, that's how, that's at least how I would go to sleep. I'd lay down, I'd imagine playing for the Lakers and I'd imagine what the uniforms look like. I'd imagine where we'd be playing and, you know, the smell of the arena and all sorts of stuff. And I would see myself, you know, getting hot, you know, and, you know score 10 straight points. And then, but in a dream, like, why would you ever interrupt that? Like, you're not going to have a dream and be like, okay, and then he misses his next six. Like, it's not going to happen. So you just keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming. And before I go to sleep, I'm like at 120 points, you know? <laughs> and so when you grow up, downloading that into your brain over and over and over. And then, you know, that summer, I made a thousand shots a day. A thousand. That's on top of weight training and my conditioning. I made a thousand shots. And they weren't just shots. It were shots that you saw in that game. They were specific.
Everybody has. are more important than the injury of your hamstring. And so when the game is more important than the injury itself, you don't feel that injury. Mm. Not at that time. I went in the trainer's room, my kids are in there, and you know they're looking at you and stuff, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, you know, it's all right, dad's gonna be all right. Mm -hmm. It'll be fine, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. And as a parent, you gotta set the example. You gotta set the example. This, this is another obstacle. This obstacle cannot define me. It's not going to cripple me. It's not going to be responsible for me stepping away for the game that I love. I'm going to step away on my own terms. You got to lead by example. As parents, you got to lead by example. If you want your kids to do whatever it is they want to accomplish in life, you have to show them. Mm. You got to show them. But the message we want to get across is that, you know, kids matter. Like investing heavily in kids is extremely important. In fact, more important than it is investing in adults because children are our future. So instead of spending all of our resources and doubling down on the grown-ups, let's double down on kids. And so for me, it was like, okay, I have to, I have to aim for something. Mm. So I said, I want to aim for size. I want to aim for bulk, right? So that's a tangible thing. Yeah. I'm going to go for that, right? But then also, it's you know my children, because like. Your kids can't see how hard you work. You go to the office, I come in the studio, they don't really see the effort, right? So how can we teach our children what it means to work hard? Well, you do it through training, right? So when I get up in the morning, my daughter goes with me. 4 a.m., my 15-year-old goes with me. She wow. goes with me before school, and it becomes a daddy-daughter thing. She just got her permit, right? So she drives in the morning, it becomes a cool thing, right? But through that process, she understands the value of hard work and things taking time. And the same thing with my 12-year-old, right? She practices every day, right? And so it's through those behaviors uh, um, is where I find the motivation to mm. do it. And what brings you the most joy right now? Being with my family. Really? That is, man, that is the most fun. It's just, um, you know, it's uh, hanging out with them all summer, uh, being able to, to, like, do things that I ordinarily couldn't do because uh, of training, because of sure. season and stuff like that. So being around them and watching Bianca grow up, because there are a lot of things that I miss with Natalia and Gianna because mm. I was playing. So being there every day with them is so much fun, man. So 
It brings me the most joy. What does love feel like for you? <sighs> what does love feel like? I think I would describe love as happiness. I think I'd describe it as a beautiful journey. You know, it has its ups and downs, right? Whether it's in marriage, or whether it's in the career, you know, things are never perfect. But through love, you continue to persevere and you mm -hmm. move through them. You move through them. And then through that storm, beautiful sun emerges. Right? And inevitably, another storm comes. And guess what? You ride that one out too. Mm -hmm. So I think love is a certain determination and persistence to go through the good times and the bad times with the someone or something uh, that you truly love. My uh, vision of what my goal is changed drastically as I got older. So like as a kid, I said, I wanna be the best ever, right? And now you go through your life and everything you do is try to be the best ever, be the best ever, be the best ever. And as you get older, you start understanding that those things are very superficial things, right? And everybody has a different opinion about it. No matter what you do, I can win 20 championships. There's always an opinion on who's the best. Everybody has different opinions. And so I started really kind of understanding, maybe that's not the important thing. Maybe the important thing is to, you know, how do we, as a team grow, how do I help my teammates be better? So that was the first change for me. And then as I got older still, it became more about um, how are you inspiring others right, to find themselves? That is the ultimate championship. So won five championships, that's great. Another team won a championship this year. The team's gonna win a championship next year. Those things come and they go. But what stays is how do you use your passion and use that to inspire somebody else to create their passion, and then how can they pass that on to the next person? That is true success. Um, so my goals have changed drastically from the time I was six years old to the time I was 17 to the time I was 25 and now sitting here at 37. It's always teaching the game, right? Teaching the game through various ways. You know, it's, we do camps and clinics, we do those things, and, but also through storytelling, right? How can you, how can you share stories with the rest of the world that challenges them to look internally and, and to learn things like process and learn how to navigate the sense of self and all these things. How can you infuse that into entertainment in, in a way that pushes our culture and our society forward? You know, those are the questions that I'm really, really intrigued by and that's what we'll focus on. What I have to do now is make sure that the people that we bring in, these obsessives that we bring in, are challenging themselves to do the best job that they think they can do. That's what I'm there for, is for them to constantly look in the mirror and self-assess and challenge themselves. If we have a project and you're saying, okay, I can do that, that's not the project we want. The projects that say, I don't know if I can animate that. I don't know how to write that story. I don't know how to do that. Those are the things we want because through that curiosity, you'll reach a level that you didn't think was possible. The definition of greatness is to inspire the people next to you. Yeah, I, I think that's what greatness is or should be. It's, it's not something that's, that, that lives and dies with one person. Mm. It's how can you inspire a person to then in turn inspire another person that then inspires another person. And that's how you create something that I think lasts forever. Yeah. And uh, I think that's our challenge as people, is to, um, is to figure out how our story can impact others and mm -hmm. motivate them in a way to create their own greatness.